here to uh, to talk to everybody else and not learn about what we do, but hopefully you walk away with something that's valuable here. Uh, so I'm Robert Lacey. I've known probably a third of the group in the uh, in the room. But for those of you that don't know me, I'm a very open book. If you have a concept or an idea or you don't like something that I talk about, uh, by all means, send me an email, send me a phone, like in the a phone call. The brochures are in your goodie bags, and uh, I welcome calls uh, pretty much until 10 p.m. So, thanks to Eco Canada for this opportunity. Uh, we've been working with Eco Canada for about 18 months. This fella here covered in mud is uh, Mitch. He came to us through Eco Canada. He did a co-op and an internship, and now he's a, a, an employee with our company. And uh, it's been a pretty painless process. I actually met Eco Canada about five years ago. I met Kevin Nielsen, the president at our very first Remtech. And uh, I had no idea what they did. I just shook his hand and nodded my head. And it was all good, and I kept on meeting them at uh, other shows. And it wasn't until about uh, 2017 in Yellowknife that I actually sat down, and I think it was maybe a slow conference. And I really learned what they did, and, uh, and that is they save you money on new employees. So as a business owner, I'm always interested in how we can save money. Uh, we use the program to basically onboard Mitch, and you know we're talking thousands of dollars. It's not a hundred bucks here and there. It's, it's a good subsidy. So we're going to, going to continue to work with Eco Canada for, for the future. Uh, we're definitely going to be using them as sort of an onboarding for other students to come on board. Uh, the Bear, Bro Bear program is something that involves uh, Indigenous training, and we're likely going to have Mitchell uh, go through that training process and hopefully get some of our uh, Indigenous Canadians involved uh, in the environmental sector. The best thing about the program with Eco Canada is that it's very low risk. It's low risk both to the employer and to the employee. It's basically a three-month program. You get half the money back from the uh, from the subsidy, so you know you're getting you're getting employees for less than minimum wage. And and there's a timeline. If they don't work out, they don't work out. There's no hard, no hurt feelings. Um, minimal time required. I think that's something important as a business owner. We all know that you know money is money, but time is also money. And uh, the, the the minimal amount of time I would say required is like an hour, maybe two hours for a, a co-op or an internship. They have a midterm sort of review, and they have a final review, and if you're like me, you're gonna copy and paste your answers because the questions are the same at the end as they are in the middle. And, uh, and it's also a great network, so thanks to you for, for coming out and being here. And uh, you know, these events are gonna continue across the country, and so yeah, get involved with Eco Canada. And now I will jump into uh, Delta Remediation. So we're a bioremediation company headquartered in Edmonton, right here just outside of Atchison. And uh, we specialize in the degradation of organic contaminants. Uh, so hydrocarbons, petrochemicals, chlorinated solvents. And we, our technology works in both soil and water. Um, we also do a little bit of phytoremediation. We have a salt technology. We also have uh, some very innovative uh, absorbent technologies and containment barriers so that we can hopefully try and stop the contamination from happening in the first place. And uh, while we definitely like supporting our Canadian market, we do a lot of work overseas as well with China and Nigeria are actually our main markets right now. So if you're involved in uh, opportunities that are overseas, we're always interested to see what's out there. I want to take a moment just to recognize some of the uh, companies that we've become friends with over the years. You know, I don't want to be up here waving the flag saying I'm the best, Delta is awesome. You know, remediation is awesome. I think that true remediation where we find the end of the life cycle for the contaminant is very important. And there's, you know, we're not the only show in town. Uh, Nelson and Ages are two thermal companies that we've worked with in the past. Nichols and Trium do some chemical uh, remediation. Ridgeline has a, an end of life cycle where they mix their different soils and, and find end of life cycle with landfill. And, uh, and we specialize in bioremediation, as I've already mentioned. So I'm sure that many of you know about bioremediation. You've probably heard of it before. For those of you that haven't, I just want to take a second and, and, and just introduce it to you. It's the use of microorganisms, so bacteria or other microorganisms, fungi, they can break down pollutants. And within bioremediation, there's really two sort of chains of technology. One is biostimulation, where you're stimulating the microorganisms that are in the ground. We call them indigenous. The other is bioaugmentation, which is what we specialize in, where we're actually introducing microorganisms into the contamination. 
So we didn't invent this, neither did our suppliers. Nature invented our technology a long, long time ago. We're perfecting what nature already created. So in, in nature, you'll find millions of microorganisms per gram. Our suppliers have got us products up into billions, and through our culture and process on site, we're reaching trillions. So we're orders of magnitude more than nature would provide, and that's how we're able to treat sites in one season. But it's not just our company, it's also our partners, our suppliers, uh, and collaboration is a big thing. Kind of one of my messages or takeaways from the evening is, you know, work with your partners, work with the people that are in your industry, and uh, everything's better. So, uh, on the biology side, this is James. He's actually supposed to be here. I don't know where James is. Oh, he is there. Everyone say hi to James. Uh, so, James is our scientist. We're using new microorganisms. Uh, Bioremediation has been around for a long time. Most of them came in a liquid culture. They're sporifying microbes. They sporify in the field as well. We're using non-sporifiers. They're much more aggressive. We're using bacteria from the Pseudomonas genus. And we're also using archaea. It's not just the product though, it's also the process. So having sterilized vessels, regulated water temperature, and clean water source also lead us to get our, our cultures into trillions before they're introduced into the contaminated site. I won't spend a lot of time on chemistry, but chemistry is just as important as the biology. We use surfactants, we use nutrients to back up the microorganisms, and we use oxygen donors when we're doing in situ remediation. I have to just touch on surfactants quickly because I love telling people how we can make water wetter. And what that means is that if you've got really contaminated soil, water will literally just beat off and it won't penetrate. Once we've used our surfactants in tandem with our water carrier, that water will now penetrate the soil. So when you've got contaminated soil that you need to get penetration into with your microorganism, surfactant is the way to go. Again, this might be uh, highly repetitive for the enviro pros in the crowd, but for those that uh, are new here, or maybe from a different industry, in situ remediation means treating in place. So that's you know drilling holes or doing injections. Uh, it can get very complicated. We actually do hydraulic fracturing. We've done some sites with uh, Geotactical out of Calgary, where they propagate sand fracks into the contaminated site, and then we use those propagated fractures to deliver our microbes and our surfactants. Into the, into the contaminated zone. Ex situ means digging, excavating. Uh, a lot of times people confuse ex situ remediation with uh, taking soil to the landfill, and uh, I mean, maybe that's up to debate, but in my, in my mind, ex situ remediation means uh, digging the site up and uh, treating the soil. The nice thing about ex situ versus in situ is that you can actually get contact with the contaminants, and as Daryl Nelson from uh, Nelson Environmental says, Remediation is a contact sport. This is just a, a quick slide I want to touch on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't invent this stuff. What we're doing is perfecting it. Um, and I feel like we're perfecting it in some means even better than our suppliers who manufacture these products. Uh, they send us the product and they say to inoculate the microorganisms uh, for 24 hours at room temperature. Well, guess what? When you're in Grand Prairie at the end of October, it ain't room temperature. So we work with the University of Alberta to basically grow under specific conditions and, and, and map where the populations go. So you can see in the top chart, there's a, a log phase where they grow and a leg phase where they come down. We did that from 5 to 30 degrees, mapped it out. Now we have what I call the, uh, the time temperature gradient. So we know that when we're dealing with you know, 5 degrees, we're not doing it for 24 hours. We're going for much, much longer. Um, we've collaborated with a lot of different universities. We've got three different projects going on right now. One with uh, Simon Fraser University in BC, and two with uh, the University of Calgary, one on Soulfly and one on uh, Mass Spec. So not every site is, uh, is good for on-site treatment. Uh, in Canada, especially Alberta, you know, landfilling is a, a very common practice, and at the end of the day, the mighty dollar usually makes sense. So what makes a good site good for bioaugmentation? Well, it's got to be remote, either remote being downtown Vancouver or Toronto, or remote being Northwest Territories or somewhere very far to truck the soil to. Um, you know, another thing is, is a site that's well understood. Um, I think in yesteryear, people used to have, you know, one sample or two samples. Sites weren't properly delineated. And then when the, you know, the treatment guy came on site and failed because he only treated half the site, he kind of got painted with that brush. And we're in the same way, you know what, we, we want to make sure that our reputation is upheld, 
So if a site isn't well understood, we might just say, sorry, you know, you need to spend some more money up front before we get involved. A big one here for, for us in Alberta and Canada, Northern Alberta, Northwest Territories is timing. Um, you know, if anybody in the audience does have a site, let's try and do it in the spring. Uh, September is always our busiest time of year because as often as I say spring and summer is the time to go, people wait, 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 and they want it done. And we do a lot of work in the fall, but the ideal timing for doing wire remediation is in the spring. And then there's some other parameters, pH, dissolved oxygen, the soil type. Um, you know, anything that would really be uh, a factor in any treatment is a factor for us as well. Just a quick case study. This was uh, done in Northern Alberta. The reason I wanted to highlight this one is because it does show the effectiveness of our technology when applied uh, late in the fall. So this was a uh, muskeg surface application, 2400 cubes. And uh, you can see here that it was done on October 2nd by November 5th. It was below detect on all spectrums of the hydrocarbon chain. And I'm very happy to present this material. We've got uh, another case study coming out from last season that we did in Northwest Territories. Uh, I've got technical data sheets and I've got MSDS and anything you can imagine if you want to do some technical reading. Uh, please feel free to uh, contact me after this talk or, or by email uh, from the brochure. So why is this all so important? Well, I'm sure everyone in the room has probably heard of the Orphan Law Association. And this is a really old graph. This is from uh, obviously 12 to 15. And you can see there's a bit of a trend. Well, the trend's gotten worse. And uh, you can see here on the right, uh, Lex and Resources went defunct and added 2,000 wells to the Orphan Law Association. The top graph, you can see the orange lines are new wells that are coming on. The green, the green little tiny bars are wells that are coming off. Uh, again, there's a bit of a trend there. And this is again old, it's, it's, not, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The red water decision, which is something that's in the news a lot, um, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy how you know, big business is, is able to you know, go through some of this legislation, but essentially it's, it's bankruptcy for profit. You know, these big oil companies can sell their assets and liabilities to juniors, they can't handle it, and they go to fund and, they, and it weighs on your hands. Maybe not your hands, but maybe your kids, maybe your kids' kids. And so I think it's important that we recognize this and we talk about it. You know, oil and gas is maybe gonna be around forever, maybe not, but uh, if you think that maybe oil and gas isn't gonna be around forever, then it's very important to recognize that we better do something about this now while there is still some revenue coming in because if everybody packs up and leaves Canada, guess what? We live here. We're gonna have to deal with this stuff. Uh, I already mentioned Le Lexin, uh, the LLR ratio. I'm involved with the tax force that I don't want to get too far into, but you know the LLR ratio. Uh, they've admitted that it's like, like a 20 billion dollar unfunded liability that taxpayers are gonna face. Our research has shown that it's probably more like 100 billion on the minimum side. So to say that we have a problem is a total understatement. We have a big problem. We need to recognize it. That's why I'm here. So not to totally be totally dreary and stuff. I mean, this is kind of sad stuff. But anyways, I think it's good to talk about. And, uh, and if anybody you know in the audience has information that contradicts what I'm talking about, please, please, please tell me because this is near and dear to my heart. I want to make people aware of what's going on. But if I'm spreading misinformation, I really want to know. Inactive wells are something that aren't really seen in the media. Inactive wells is basically a hundred dollar piece of paper you sign and send it to the government, to the AR, and you can put your well in inactive status. Inactive status means that you turn your well on for one hour, for three months of the year. So if you're an oil company and the price of oil is low or maybe you're just not feeling Canada at the time, you can put your wells into inactive status, maybe indefinitely. In the States, you have a year. Canada, who knows? This is a problem. 80,000 inactive wells in 2015. Again, I think that number's gone way, way up. I don't have the data, but scary stuff. So the takeaways here, I'm almost done, folks. Um, you know, I think we need to, to shift from the, the short-term thinking. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been in, in uh, an office in Calgary and done this same sort of pitch to an oil executive, and 
they say, oh, well, you know, we've been doing it this way for years. Or, oh, well, I'll be long gone from the company before then. Well, guess what? That thinking has to go. Because at the end of the day, if you care about being a Canadian, if you care about being an Albertan, you need to shift the way you think. Um, circular economies and NISP, if you ever get an email for NISP, it's the National Industrial Symbiosis Program. It's a, a group that gets together from different industries and they provide you a breakfast for 15 bucks. And you, you talk about what you have and what you need. And, and you find that there's actually a lot of people that have something they're trying to get rid of that you might be able to use. You know, we go through piles and piles of five gallon pails and there's somebody that needs five gallon pails for something. So rather than those pails going to the landfill, this other company can maybe even buy them from us. There's, I like to call it triple net, where there's a benefit to you, a benefit to the company you're doing the deal with, and a benefit to society. So I think we need to shift how we look at, you know, even recycling. Like if you can reuse something before you recycle it, that's a benefit, you know, because once it's recycled, there's a lot of energy that goes into recycling. Waste life cycles, you know, I'm not going to harp on this, but I think it's important that we recognize that, you know, when soil's taken to a landfill, and again, if somebody in the audience has something to, to, to teach me about, that'd be great. But my understanding is that when soil goes to a landfill, contaminated soil, it's just going to sit there and, and hopefully something's going to happen. And there's, but there's really no plan. And so companies on the, on the earlier slide that have true remediation technologies, you know, should be given some thought. Because at the end of the day, whether it's your kids or your kids' kids, somebody's gonna have to deal with that soil that's in the landfill. So kind of bringing this back home to what I said earlier about collaboration, you know, the environmental space is so big and there's so many awesome people in the industry, so many awesome people here tonight that I know personally and I consider a friend. You know, reach out. Competitors don't have to be competitors. They can be competitors if they want to, but they can also be collaborators. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, even our, at my family, my mom says, no politics on the table. You know what, mom? We don't get to talk often, so let's be civil about it, and let's talk about things. I think that uh, this whole, you know, we've got quite a show down south, but I think it's important to talk about things and not just, you know, stick your head in the sand. Um, the emerging indigenous economy, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity here. Um, I think Eagle Canada views that as well with their bear program. But, um, you know, I think there's part of the reconciliation is providing business opportunities to Aboriginal companies. We are actively seeking those partnerships. We're just about to sign the deal for our first one at Fort McMurray. But uh, there's a lot of problems all across the the planet and, and Canada and Alberta, and we're definitely looking to do business with other Aboriginal entities. And last but not least, engage with the youth through programs like Eco Canada. You know, at the end of the day, um, we're not going to be able to carry the stick forever. We're going to have to pass it on to, to younger people, and I think it's important to utilize programs like Eco Canada to get these types of folks in your industry. So, together, we have an opportunity to create the world's leading environmental workforce. Thank you.